Hey, what's up, guys? Today we're going to talk to Steve Rack from up in Ohio. He's got over 30 years in the lawn care, landscaping, snow removal, maintenance business. Steve, welcome back to the program. Hey, thanks for having me back, Paul. I really appreciate it. Yeah, we had a ton of positive feedback when you were previously on the program and you were just warming up <laughs> as we're getting to the tail end of that conversation. So give us a very abbreviated update of who you are for guys that are just catching on to you for the first time. Okay, basically based out of Cleveland here, I own Southwest Landscape Management, mostly commercial maintenance company and been in business about 30 years. And I also do consulting and helping small, I try to help smaller companies grow to their potential. Try to build the lifestyle you want with your business. Been doing this for a long time. I know the commercial landscape business world pretty well. And that's kind of the, the simple two cent version. Well, this is really good, Steve. I really would like for you to unpack the commercial landscape business. I'm expert, if you will, on residential. Mm -hmm. And I was coaching a guy yesterday, or actually it was, uh, last week. He's from South Carolina, Steve. And he was asking me about these commercial accounts. And I actually told him run from them because it was one was a church with a cemetery and they wanted 2300 per month. And I was running the man hour rates and I was like, there's no way you can make a profit on that. Basically said to him, we're currently paying the other guy 2,300, but we're looking for an even better price. Can you give us a better price? And I was crunching all the numbers and I was at like 5,200 a month. And I was like, I don't think you can even do it. You know what I mean? It's, it's so low. And then he gave me an apartment example of a, it was 1300 a month and I'm running the month numbers. I was like, I don't know how these companies are giving these low, low, low prices. They're it was like $35 a man hour. I was calculating if his if his math was right on how long it will take to do the maintenance. So I told him to run for his life. Don't take the jobs. Yeah. But I told him that doesn't mean all commercial work is this crazy. But anyway, I want you to share a little bit about how to actually get these jobs and, and bid them so it's actually profitable. And, and what have you noticed about these low ballers out there? That's wow. That's a lot to unpack. The commercial world is definitely different than the residential. I mean, it's not as touchy feely. So, you know, you're not getting that one on one with your, like you are with your residential clients. However, what's nice about commercial is you have contractual work, which is really kind of sweet. So, you're getting paid every month, no matter whether you're there or not. Now, you have to be there, you have to, you have to perform. There are times when, if it's really dry in the middle of the summer, you don't have to cut the grass. You're not going to take a hit for that. So you're getting, you're basically amortizing your service over 28 weeks or 28 cuts over April through November in the Cleveland market. Now other people have different markets that they're in that they may be having longer or shorter seasons. As far as the commercial maintenance, as far as the like getting the jobs and the low, well, there's a lot to think about here. So let's talk about the pricing. As far as the pricing is concerned, it is, it's very tight, you know, and there is a lot of competition. Sometimes you're stuck in the room with a, with a bigger company like Brightview or uh, Davy Tree. Like those are some examples that are in, those are national companies that are in my market. I know a lot of times if I'm bidding against those guys, then I'm not going to get the job just because I'm going to be more expensive. I've learned how to be competitive in this market and in the commercial world, but that's primarily by being a really good service provider, you know, dealing with phone calls, calling people back, trying to be proactive on the properties. When you're dealing with the property managers, giving them a call, telling them, hey, I walked the property, I saw, you know, you had a couple shrubs that were dead, or maybe you had, you know, you need this area mulched, that kind of thing. It's an upsell, but the customer loves it. So tell us a little bit more about what's going through your calculations, your pricing, so that you know what number to put in. Because you met you you casually mentioned, well, Brightview and Davy Tree are going to be cheaper than you. How do you know what your price is and what you kind of have to stick to to remain profitable? And for those who are just tuning in and missed our previous episode, uh, Steve runs about a million dollar business up there. So you have quite a bit of overhead compared to a weekend warrior or Chuck in the truck, yeah. as we call them. And that, that was me. I was a glorified Chuck in the truck. I'm uh, just. Yeah, that's around. fine. There's nothing wrong with that either. So how do you come up with your numbers? I see this question. I'm like, I'm on a couple of Facebook groups and I see a lot of questions of guys asking, well, I have 12 acres to cut. What should I charge? Well, nobody is going to be able to tell you what to charge unless they know your numbers. And in order to come up with your hourly rate, there, there's a lot that goes into that. It's not just, well, I should charge 35 bucks an hour or 50 bucks an hour or 80 bucks an hour. 
you know, I'm in a market in Cleveland where just a couple of years ago, $38 was was probably the average of what people were charging. And now it's gone up substantially. However, even if you don't have, a, you always have some sort of overhead. So even if you look at what you have, your truck payment, your, even if you're working out of your house, you know, what percentage of that are you allocating towards your business? You have to have your overhead figured out. You have to have your average hourly rate. So if you're paying yourself 20 bucks an hour, whatever it is, that's just an arbitrary number and paying two helpers 15 bucks an hour, you've got to take those three numbers, divide them and come up with your average wage. That's the simple version. Then you have to take your overhead and you have to divide that by the number of hours, gross hours that your company works in a year. That's your overhead rate. So say your hourly rate is $18 an hour and your overhead is 20. Now you're at 38. Then you have to put your profit on top of that. If you want a 10% profit, you know, you're looking at 41, 42, something. My math's probably not right. But the bottom line is, is you have to know what your overhead is. You have to know what your labor is going to cost you. And that is, is going to determine your hourly rate wage. Now, on top of that, you can't be like 10 bucks an hour or 20 bucks an hour above your competition in the commercial world because you're not going to get any work. So you have to know what the market bears, which is why you need something like a benchmark to look at more about what other people are looking at when they're looking at their books. And I mean, what I mean by is your, you know, your profit and loss, your accounts receivable, that type of thing. There's benchmarks out there for that. And a benchmark is basically a, a study that someone like National Association of Landscape Professionals, they have benchmark studies. So you pull one of those up or, you know, you got to buy it. And that's going to tell you what the industry average is for labor. What's the industry average for the cost of fuel? What's the industry average for repairs and maintenance? Once you get those benchmarks down and you're looking at that versus what you're doing, that's going to give you a baseline of at least giving you an idea of where you're at with your costs. Now, I know that sounds like a whole lot of work, but if you really want to know your numbers and what you need to charge per hour, you kind of have to delve into that stuff. And the bigger you get, the more you're turning from a one-man operation to a three-man to a, a million-dollar business. Those are things that are really super important. You can't ignore that once you get up to a size like, like mine. And mine's not huge by any stretch, but that's, that's the point I'm trying to make. You have to know those numbers. That's very well said, Steve. I really appreciate the thorough explanation. I know we have a lot of Folks that are in year one, two, three of their business, and nobody explained this to me when I was starting out. So I appreciate the thoroughness for sure. Mm -hmm. What's your advice as you're bidding these jobs, getting the contracts, how you set those up? And then on the tail end, when you're starting to wind down the season, how do you prevent from somebody coming in and lowballing you? And, and how, how do you have longevity serving your customers and, and reoccurring work year after year? Because it seems cutthroat compared to residential it's cutthroat. But I think one thing that I've learned over the years is to, to have that relationship with the client. I've got some property management companies that I've been working with literally for 30 years. I've got other businesses that I've been working with for 20 years. It's about the relationships. I'm still hands-on when it comes to that. So if I'm anywhere in my business right now, it's dealing with the customers, dealing with the clients. It's calling them up. It's texting them. It's trying to stay in front of them. I react to whatever it is that they do. I might not go out and look at whatever problem that they have. One of my, my account manager might do that. But the point being is I'm trying to build that relationship with them, whoever's in charge of that particular contract. So say, for example, I've got a property manager that, that's in charge of five apartment complexes. Well, when that guy calls me, if it's a Saturday, I'm answering the phone. If I get an email from him and it's something urgent, I'm going to take care of it right then and there. So that's going to help when it comes to bid time and somebody comes in and, and underbids you. Now, the guys have to perform in the field as well. The quality of the work has to be there. And that's something that we always strive to be really good at as well. But that still doesn't mean that somebody can't come in and underbid you, which happens to me. And, and you lose the property. It's unfortunate in this business, but it's a kind of a bidding war out there in the commercial world. So if I understand what you're saying is you try to do obviously excellent work that the properties are pristine and, and, and looking gorgeous, 
Plus, you're trying to be Johnny on the spot with punctual communication with your client. And in effort in doing that, you're hoping that when it comes time to bidding, that there will be other companies that come in under you, but you hope that they'll continue with your price and your service, even if you're not the lowest because you did a good job. Yeah, the big thing is, is you have to put yourself in their shoes. Let's pretend like you're a residential business landscape guy and you want to get your first commercial job. How, how are you going to do that? Well, first of all, you have to get out there and they have to know who you are. So the best bet with that is to look up property management companies in your area, look them up on Google or whatever. Now, before the pandemic, what I used to do, and and I'm sure that you can probably do that again now. I don't know if people are still weirded out by you stopping in, but we used to go out. We had coffee cups made up with with our company logo and everything on them. We put a little Danish in there that was in a pre wrapped Danish in the coffee cup, a card, and drop them off at every property management company in Cleveland. And I got a lot of phone calls from them that year saying, hey, you know, you want to bid this property? And we, we got some good relationships out of that. So it takes some proactivity on your part to go out there and knock on doors. Stop into your local fast food place. Say there's a McDonald's. Well, one person probably owns 10 McDonald's or 30. We picked up 55 Burger Kings a few years ago just by me cold calling and stopping in and dropping a card off. That's so, not good for your diet. <laughs> no, this is true. Uh, but that's how, that's kind of how you get your foot in the door with these commercial properties. We were all residential when we started. My father started this company out of his garage and really never wanted to grow it. He just, he enjoyed doing residential work. And then I came on board and we never had a condo association or really anything other than residential work. And then we picked up a condo association and I saw the potential and I'm like, wow, this is different. Like they're going to pay us no matter what we do. If we don't now, obviously you got to perform, but if you're not there. Okay. So you're not like, there were so many times when we were doing our residential route, where it was middle of August and we'd, we'd pull up to a house and they'd say, oh, don't cut us today. And, you know, we didn't have contracts back then. We weren't thinking as business people. We were thinking more as like, you know, we're going to go out and make some money and that's it. But then there were days where we'd go out and we wouldn't make, you know, hardly anything because it was August and the grass was dried out and we're driving around burning gas and not making any money that day. So when I when we got our first commercial account, I thought, Wow, what a great concept. So we started getting more and more into that. And that became our that became our business model. But as far as bidding them and things like that, again, you need to kind of know your hourly rate, your production hours for your mowers. So measure the property if that's something you have to do. I do a lot of old school, like I'll measure it, but I'm still kind of one of those guys that can look at a property and tell you how long it's going to take to cut it. Most people don't do it like that anymore. So the math... And you're again, you're in Cleveland, Ohio. Go Browns, by the way. I'm a, I'm a fellow Cleveland Browns fan down here in Atlanta, by the way. The, Br- the Browns are currently on an airplane flight to my city. But anyway, that's neither here nor there. You're looking at the property, Steve. You're calculating how many man hours it's going to take per service. Once you figure that out, are you multiplying that by 28, then dividing by seven months? Or like, what's the math? And again, forgive me for not knowing Cleveland market we're year round down here, but what's the math then once you calculate, I think this is going to be X amount of hours per service. How do you take the math to actually give them an actual bid? Great question. Okay. So if you're looking at mowing only, and let's just say it's a thousand dollars a cut, we'll make it simple. Okay. So it's a thousand dollars per cut. We figured out what our hourly rate is. It's 50 bucks an hour. So we figured it out. We got a thousand dollars a cut and in Cleveland, it's 28. Basically, we we budget for 28 cuts, and that's from April 1st to November 30th. Well, there's about 30, 35 weeks in there. So I always tell, and I make sure that I'm, most of the customers know that because that's kind of how it works in this market. But I try to let them know that you know we do budget for a couple of skipped cuts. But I also tell them that if we go over, we're not going to charge you either. We kind of keep it amortized. This is going to be your monthly payment. So we take that. So that's $28,000. We'll take that $28,000 and divide it by eight. And then that'll be our contract price. Now, other things that are included in that, depending on, on how you work your contracts, is your spring cleanup, your fall cleanup, and your shrub trimming. I don't like to put mulch in my contracts as far as like amortizing that over eight months because... I need to get that money 
as soon as we're finished with mulching, because some of our mulch jobs are $20,000. So I don't want to amortize that over eight months. Fertilization is the same thing. We, we bill that as we apply it. So if each property gets four applications of fertilizer, we bill it as it, but, but those two prices are not part of the, of the amortization. I know that commercial is different than residential. So once you establish your monthly amount, uh, let me get a calculator here. So we're, we're helping people out here, Steve, 28 grand divided by eight months. That would be 3,500 per month. Does that sound right? That sounds right. Okay. So it begins the month of April. When are you sending the invoice? When are you receiving payment? I know commercial can be a slower than residential. It's like, hey, Mrs. Smith, I'm going to get your card on file and charge it on April 1st, May 1st. And most residential customers, because you're talking directly to them, they're cool with that. But when it gets into commercial, you're dealing with payroll and, and like accounts mm-hmm. receivable and payable. And like, you know, these big corporations are, uh, they got their system and processes. And how, how do you handle all of that? What's your protocol? That's very difficult. The cash flow as far as dealing with commercial clients is probably after labor, after me dealing with with people and hiring people, that's probably my biggest challenge. You have to pick your battles when you're dealing with that because you may have a a client that has $200,000 worth of contracts, but they're paying 30, 45 days. You have to make a decision if you can, if you can live with that because they will like, like it's their policy is their policy. And so you can tell them that, well, my policy is 15 days, but they're going to tell you up front, well, Steve, I just got an email from somebody like that, by the way. They're going to tell you, your policy is 15 days, but I'm telling you our policy is 45 days. So you have to make a decision, a business decision based on that and say, can we handle that? Can we take that, whatever it is, 10 grand a month or whatever, can we wait 45 days for that? Now, in order to combat that a little bit, I send my bills out on the first of the month, not the 30th. If it's a contract bill, I send it out on the first of the month. So for April, I'll send it out April 1st. Okay. But for some of the properties, you're not getting that first payment until May 15th for the net 45 folks. Mm -hmm. You heard it from Steve, folks. And again, Steve, I I don't know if you ever listened to my program, but I'm not the most friendly towards commercial work because all all of my experiences have been this. And, And when I was starting off, I couldn't wait. I did a Carabas Italian grill and I think we did, we did a pot, we did a pine straw down here. I did it in January and here I am in the spring, still chasing down my money from the Outback Steakhouse Institute in Florida for Carabas. I guess Outback owns them and I'm sitting there talking, calling the long story short, they sent the check to the wrong address supposedly. Mm -hmm. And it's net for, well, anyway, at that time I needed that money and it was stressing me out and I wasn't established to where I could absorb waiting and so finally, I just said, forget it. I'm just going to cut Randy and Sweet Sue's yard and get paid pretty swiftly. you got 30 years under your belt. You figured all this out. So I, want, I wanted to have a unbiased opinion towards commercial work instead of telling people don't do it. So, Yeah, I wouldn't say don't do it. I would say when you get into it, you need to know what you're getting into. So do your homework. There's magazine articles and things like that that you can read. You have to learn the business a little bit before you get into it because you don't want to get burned. You have to be careful there are some bad property managers out there too. Like I, I've had my share of that. And there are ones that I will not work with no matter what. I don't care what they throw at me. I will not work at them, with them because I've had bad experiences with them. And, and, you know, I learned my lesson, but that doesn't mean I can't sign up with somebody else who's not great, but you have to do your homework as a business owner to decide, is this something I want to get into? On the flip side, it's a very solid business. It's a good business. And you can combat that cash flow issue that we talked about. So say you've got all your customers and they're 30, 45 days or whatever. Well, you can still do like we do enhancement work and we do some enhancement work for residential customers. So we will be doing enhancement work for residential clients um, Monday through Friday, say, um, and then we're, we're getting paid from those jobs as we do them. So we expect payment when we're done with those. So we can be bringing in money from enhancement work on residential jobs Monday through Friday, five days a week throughout the month. And that that helps with the cash flow, if that makes sense. Yeah, totally. You talk about combating cash flow. What are some other misconceptions that people have, Steve, about commercial work that we you could also talk into and, and combat? So give me an example. 
Well, the biggest example is cash flow, and you you yeah. already you already addressed that. I think another one, and again, I'm I'm not in that world. I I, I dipped my toes in that world, and then I had about five sour experiences, and I said, forget this. Yeah. The other one would be the clunky communication. You're not at Randy's house. We, we use Randy as our like fictitious lawn customer, yeah. Randy, right? And he's he's out there talking to you or whatever. But now you're talking to layers and layers, depending on what property it is. You might be talking to someone out of state. You yeah. know what I mean? So so that's a misconception. I'm kind of insinuating that that I think people shy away from the line of work that you and Rickman and Brightview, excuse me, and uh, Davey, I'm out, I'll date myself here. What other misconceptions, the communication, talking to, not being able to talk to your actual customer face-to-face or any others that you think of that you'd want to share? It could be a perception issue. I mean, I have the same kind of feeling like when I'm dealing with a residential client now because we don't do that many of them. So I think it's more of, of a comfort factor. Like you do get to talk to your customers and I, I think maybe people are somewhat intimidated by property managers and, and this this business manager and owners and things like that. But you have to remember, they're just people like you and they're just looking for a good service provider. So some of them are bad apples, but you know, there's some residential clients that are bad apples too. So I think you have to, to look at it from a different perspective. If you're doing all residential now and you wanna try that first commercial job, don't let that first experience taint you or make no matter what. Um, let take that first experience with a grain of salt because you may not get the right customer. I think it's it's a matter of like navigating that process of getting into the commercial work. You know, HOAs are a little more like having residential clients versus picking up a bunch of apartments or nursing homes or things like that. But it's a good point that you bring up about the communication. I think it's. I think it's one of those things where you you just have to, there's a comfort level there that you have to get to. And you kind of have to break down those barriers and talk to these people, just like I'm talking to you. And that's what I do now. I get a lot of inquiries about HOA. Can you speak pros and cons? Because I know even though we use commercial as a blanket statement, it's different when it's a business park versus an apartment complex versus an actual residential HOA type Mm -hmm. neighborhood. What are your honest thoughts about HOA work? They're tough. A lot of complaints. It's really hard work. There's two types of HOAs. In in my neck of the woods, we have like a master association where we're not cutting any of the homes, but we're cutting all the green space. So, you know, we could have a property with 30 acres of green space. They have tennis courts and they have pools and they have entrance ways and they have all kinds of different areas, uh, baseball fields where the kids play baseball, stuff like that. So those type of HOAs in my opinion, are are the best because you're not dealing with each individual home there and you're cutting the green spaces and those are big open areas. You can cut them with riding mowers and it's not as hands like hand holding like you are with a, let's talk about a condo association. So when you're dealing with that, you're cutting everybody's lawn, you're dealing with everybody's shrubs, you're dealing with the mulching, you're dealing with the fertilization and everybody thinks that you should do it their way when they don't have that understanding of you're not going to use a 21 inch mower on a hundred home HOA where you're doing a hundred condo so a hundred condos. So they're very, very like, they're very difficult. I don't want people to shy away from it because of that, but it, but it's true. When you're dealing with a condo association, you're dealing with a board of probably three or four people. You're dealing with a president that you're going to have to talk to and deal with and you know, when I, I, I don't have a lot of those anymore, I don't really like like them that much. So we don't do a lot of that work. Well, there you go, folks. You heard, you heard it from Steve himself. Well, is there anything we're leaving out here about commercial work that, that you want to share with folks that are dabbling or thinking about getting into it? I just think if, if you want to try it, if you want to get into it, don't be intimidated by it. Start with something that's comfortable. Don't take on something you can't handle. You know, you might want to push the envelope a little bit because you, you might surprise yourself. Like, I think in this industry, we, we really need to look at, and, and I don't want to say anything bad about these big companies, but at the end of the day, do we really want this industry to be at like the Walmart? This is what's happening with the Brick or the Brickmans or the Bright View, Valley Crest, yeah. those type of companies. There's a ton of work out there. So I'd love to see more guys, even your size, my size, like, dominating the market and doing a great job. 
-hmm. instead of having the national companies popping in and just taking over your market. Because sooner or later, that's going to happen. These companies are buying up. I, I've had all my friends are sold. Like all mm -hmm. my friends in this industry in Cleveland, they're all they all sold. Like they're, they're all sold. They're done. I, I'm still here. I got a couple friends that are still here, but most of them are sold. We need to combat that a little bit. And I'm not saying I'll never sell, but I'm saying that let's give them a fight. You guys can do this work and it's good work. You see Brickman driving around or whatever. I call him Brickman. Yeah, but, I do too. The Valley Crest and Brickman merged a few years back and it's called yeah. Brightview. But for those of us yeah. who've been around for a while, we we interchangeably call them Brickman. But they, they're officially Brightview. I know what you're saying. You know what I'm saying. These companies are, are consolidating. So I don't know. Maybe I'm a little old school. But I, I, I think that there's a lot of guys out there that are doing great work and they're doing, you know, all residential and maybe they want to try doing the commercial transfer that over to your commercial and give it a shot and see how it goes. And the best way to get into it is to try cold calling. I know it sucks. It's not my favorite thing, but it works. You can also go online, find HO. A lot of homeowner associations have the websites now. So you can go right on there and send an email right to the president of the association. I normally will send an email to everybody on the board and say, hey, you know, we're, we're in your area, we're doing this, we're doing that. More so when we were more pursuing that work, I'm not pursuing that work that much anymore. But look into your property management company, stop in, introduce yourself. They're looking for people too. They're looking for a good company and say, hey, you know, I can handle, I'm, I'm in this area. These are the areas that I service. And I do a lot of residential work right in your area. I'd like to to pick up some of your properties or at least have an opportunity to bid on. That's so good, Steve. Well, I really appreciate your time and, and decades of expertise in this industry. I'm absolutely honored to have somebody with your level of knowledge about commercial work share this. Uh, you offer coaching and, and consulting to businesses that want to learn from you. Tell us a little bit more about how somebody can connect with you and kind of get plugged into your ecosystem. I do coaching. My brother and I have been doing like consulting for quite a few years. And we we focus on the, the businesses that are doing a million or less in sales. So anybody from 50,000 up to 900,000 can bring us in and, and we try to help grow that company and probably just help you with your whatever it is that you need. Like we do a lot of delving into what's going on in your business and like say your goals. And if you want to hire, you know, I want to hire a key person. How do you do that? How to get into commercial sales. My brother does design build. So between the two of us, we can cover all the bases. So we do that. I do coaching on Fridays. I have a calendar online. It's I can't remember if it's 150 an hour or something like that. We can do an hour session and can sign up that way. I'll, I'll make sure that Paul gets the info. I also have an email letter that I put out that I can maybe give you guys my email address and, and give it to Paul and he can put it in there if you want to put that in there, Paul, so that you guys can sign up for that. And I have a YouTube channel called The Scapers Network. I'm still working on putting my videos up. I'm not the greatest with that, but I, I do try to do that occasionally.